else to stand on There are doors that some will open They never will go through But someone else will journey far Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mount Corey United Methodist Church. I'm Mike Noggle, the pastor here, and I'm so glad to see you here this morning, coming out in the weather this morning. I'm glad those of you who are decided to join us online have done so. Um, I know several of you are in warmer climes than we have right now, but I will tell you that we had uh, the temperatures mild, there's no wind, beautiful snowflakes falling down, blanketing everything. So all of you who are seeing sunshine every single day, that boring stuff, we got beauty up here. That's all I can tell you. Uh, although I think that everybody here in the congregation just spit up in their mouth a little bit over that. Uh, but, uh, but I'm wearing black, so I stand out against the white. But thank you all for your indulgence as I was gone last week. And I want to thank uh, Mary Skilleter for filling in uh, and giving the message uh, last Sunday. Uh, very excited to uh, remind everybody that this evening at 6 o'clock right here in this sanctuary, uh, we're uh, having our first contempor uh, Sunday evening contemporary service of the new year. Uh, Abe Kramer, uh, some of you may know, he's uh, a guitarist and vocalist, very, very good, and he's been around the area, a lot of people know him. He's going to be here and pr provide the music for a contemporary service. And then the testimony is a friend of mine, uh, Lana Mosser. Lana grew up in Ukraine uh, for the first uh, 20 or so years of her life and uh, moved over here into the States. But when war broke out last year, she saw a family and a sister over in danger area. And she's going to talk about how prayer helps as, as the... the, the uh, uh, process move forward of how her sister uh, was able to get out of the country and, and so on and so forth. So I think it'll be a wonderful experience, a wonderful evening for you if you can come. Um, 
I know some people over at Pleasant View asked, and uh, some people here, especially with uh, weather being uncertain for some people, whether we were going to live stream, because we typically don't live stream our contemporary services. Uh, this one we may, I just have to double check with, with Abe and Lana to see if uh, they're okay with it. If they are, we'll probably do that. I'm not trying to discourage attendance tonight. It's still good, be good to have a good crowd here in person, but um, in case those who cannot be here, we may have that access for you. I also want you uh, to know that um, this Thursday evening, uh, 26th of January, the uh, Christian Clearinghouse Annual Dinner and Meeting is going to be held uh, from five to seven. I'm going representing our two churches. If anybody else would like to go along, uh, they're welcome to do it. Uh, it's over strictly at 7. They're having a dinner, so nothing else. You get a free dinner out of it Thursday night. So if you don't know what you're having to eat, hey, let me know. Uh, I'll get you set up. Also, uh, one of the things that we did not get done uh, in the last couple months uh, before the end of the year uh, was get the uh, nominating committee together uh, for the roles of ministry for this coming year. Uh, we're going to here in the next week or so. We're doing the same thing at Pleasant View. Uh, so in, on the table where the uh, bulletins are is now a updated list of 2023 uh, there are some blanks, obviously, that we need to fill in, and we'll have some people we're going to be calling to fill in those uh, opportunities as people roll off committees and others roll on. Uh, but uh, if the rest of the, the uh, positions have been fairly static. Some of you have been in some of those for a while. So I just ask those of you who are here to look at that list. Uh, if you have any objections to where your name is at on there right now, let me know. Otherwise, we're going to keep you there. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that's the quickest and easiest way to do that. Um, let's see here. want to just let you know, uh, uh, Dan Houston, that's Dale and Peggy's son, has ha had a birthday on Friday. So did Cassie Coppas that has the three boys that live next to the park here and comes here occasionally. Uh, she had a birthday uh, today, uh, on Friday. And this coming Wednesday, Toby uh, Berkey is having uh, a birthday. So happy birthday to all of them. Are there other announcements? Yes, Jean. Don't forget we have a sign-up sheet back here for children's moments. Um, please um, think about it. It's not that difficult. The kids like to get to know everybody. So if you could just sign up. It's only once a month we need somebody. So 12 people and we've got it and I've already taken care of one of them so and I'll probably be taking care of the next one too so we're down to 10 so if 10 people could just just choose a month and just you don't have to do much just talk to the kids a little bit very good thank you Jean and I appreciate all the the youth uh, team do for the church and the youth of this church anything else uh, before we begin worship today Lana will you prepare hearts and minds for worship
Come, let us praise God together, for God is great and worthy of our praise. Let's tell stories of God's power and majesty, his mighty acts throughout history. Let's remember the compassion he has shown towards us, his mercy and unfailing love generation after generation. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Let's worship the Lord together. Let us pray. Lord, our eyes look to you in hope, and you give us what we need. You open your hand and satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. We turn to you again, longing to be filled, to eat of the bread of life, to drink from your life-giving streams, to taste your goodness and live. May the time we spend together in your presence this morning nourish our hearts and minds. May it strengthen our relationship with you and renew our commitment to live in this world as your faithful disciples. For you alone are God, the source and sustainer of life. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Will you please join us in our opening hymn this morning? Uh, There's within my heart a melody. It can be found on page 380 of your hymnal or on the screen. And if you're able, please rise. Continue worshiping with Jesus Shall Reign on page 157. If you're looking at the hymnals, we're just doing the first and fifth verses. Spread from shore to 
Thank you. You may be seated. We've come to that time in our worship service where we want to take our joys and concerns to the Lord. Um, I have a couple that I want to share with you, and then uh, I'll open it up in case anybody else has any that they would like to, to share. Uh, first of all, uh, many of you know um, Nell Dezerker, who lives in the community. Um, uh, she passed away uh, from cancer this past Monday. Uh, and her husband is in the nursing home, um, I believe with uh, dementia or of some kind. Uh, so be with um, the Zerker family as they go through this uh, time of loss and transition. I also have a praise that I want to uh, lift up, and that's for Bob Couples, and that he's here today. Uh, early in the week, he had a very short stay in the hospital for a, a minor issue, but he's back and he's doing great, and it's very good to see you here. Okay. <laughs> well, it's still good to see you here. <laughs> Are there any others? Uh, yes. Phyllis Davis isn't here today. She's not feeling well, so if we could pray for her. And she's asked for prayer for her niece, Jamie, who has COVID, and her friend, Cindy, who has some health issues. Very well. And we miss you, Phyllis, but we know that you are listening when you're not here, so thank you. I have a praise. Uh, last Tuesday, our brother-in-law uh, became ill and got to the hospital quickly and just in time because he got four stents put in arteries and he'll have uh, medication for two others, but he's doing very well and got home in three days. Wow, that's great. What's his first name? Bill. Bill. Okay. Are there others? And while he's taking the mic around, Gene, what was uh, Phyllis's friend's name? The last one that was Cindy. Cindy, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Tian had uh, an MRI earlier in the week and uh, still no changes, which is good. Uh, he's currently involved in some uh, programs with the VA that uh, are designed to help encourage mental and physical activities, and some positive things are coming out of that. We had a very nice visit over Christmas uh, down at Tennessee. We all got together there. Um, it's interesting. He uh, doesn't remember names too well, including Nicole's, so it's mostly, hey, you, but that's okay. I do that myself. Um, as far as myself, I've had several issues over the last uh, four weeks that uh, have completely taken me out of my comfort zone. I just want to say that uh, I felt the presence of God with me as I've dealt with and continue to de deal with those issues. He's always there for you, and we are as well, Bob. It's good news on TN, too. Uh, I know he's been through a lot, and it's good to hear he has come this far. Regina. We have two grandchildren, Brody and Olivia. Same house. They've got the flu pretty bad. Now, how's your knee? I'm coming. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Probably a month or so ago, I mentioned about uh, Brandy Moss, uh, from, originally from the Andor area. Uh, she is in Houston, and she has done gone through one round of chemo, and due to side effects, she was in the hospital several days with that. Uh, she is now in the process of her second round of chemo, and they have projected that she will have a stem cell transplant uh, sometime in February. So her mom is down there uh, staying, and uh, 
husband didn't get to go down for a short visit, but of course he's back up here. And, uh, so, that's, yeah. Okay, we'll remember Brandy as well. Are there any others? If not, will you join us in our prayer hymn this morning, Jesus is All the World to Me. It's on 469. If you're using the hymnals, we're just doing the first and second verse. You may rem remain seated during this song. Father God, it is such a privilege to be able to come into your house this morning and to give you our worship and praise. Lord, you are with us through so much and you give us so many gifts. We thank you for the gift of family and for rest and for rejuvenation that you provide us from time to time, especially when we are able to get together with family that we don't get to see all that often. And how wonderful that is to spend that time together. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus too because without him, we would not be able to be adopted into your family as your children. But because you loved us that much, you sent him to pay a price that we could never pay for ourselves that we might spend eternity with you. And that is the promise and hope that the Zerker family has as well. So be with them as they mourn the loss of Nelda, as they continue to care for um, her husband in the nursing home. Give them a peace and comfort that passes all understanding, and they may see you in the midst. Thank you for the healing that you have done in the lives of Tian and Bob and Regina and the continued uh, uh, work that you're doing in the life of Bill. We know that we can trust you, and, and we, when we look, we can see you working within us. And we're so grateful for you and for our church family who comes around us when we need them and support us in prayer. I want to also lift up Brody and Olivia and Brandy as they go through their illnesses, and Phyllis as well, and Janie, and Cindy. We just ask that your healing touch be on each one. You know what is needed. We have many people on our prayer list as well that are on there and have been for some time, and you know what is needed, and we trust you will take care of them in the way only that you could. 
We also know that there are unspoken requests on the hearts of those who are listening online and those who are here in this sanctuary this morning. Things that you already know because you're aware of them before they pass our lips. But we do want to take a moment and lift them up to you now. We do thank you for all the gifts that you give us. And out of those gifts, you allow us to bring our tithes and offerings uh, to you uh, to be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. So as we came in, when we put that in the basket, we just ask you to bless each gift and each giver. Give us the wisdom to know the best way to use those funds to the furtherance of your kingdom. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus. And it is in his name we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Boys, are you wanting to come forward? We got Jaden and Joseph coming up. How you doing today? You going to go out and play in the snow this afternoon? Maybe. Don't know. Well, I got to tell you uh, about uh, someone, uh, a boy that I know. His name is John. So it's not Joseph or Jaden, it's John. And John was in the living room of his house and he had been told time and time again, don't be throwing the ball in the house. You'll knock something over and break it. Sure enough, he threw the ball in the house and you know what happened? He knocked over his mom's favorite vase and broke it. A little bit later, mom walks in and she said, what happened to this vase? Who broke it? Now, John had the choice. He could say, one me. Or he could say, I don't know what happened to it. Or he could say, I'm sorry, Mom, I threw the ball and I broke it. What do you think he should say? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, I think that's right. Because you know what, when... When your mom or dad asks you that question about what happened, most of the time they already know. They just want to hear you say it. And you know what also happens when you say I'm sorry is that it allows uh, for our parents to forgive us for when we, when we screw up. And God is kind of like that. He already knows every time we screw up. We don't have to tell him. But he wants us to go to him and say, hey, Lord, we messed this up and we're sorry. Will you forgive us? And you know what's the wonderful thing about God? When we say we're sorry and we ask him to forgive us, he always does. How about let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and for your care for us. We thank you for parents who love and care for us. We ask that you give us the the ability to tell the truth, even when sometimes that's, that's hurtful and we know that there are consequences, but give us the, the wisdom to do that and always to come to you with our problems because we know that you will forgive us when we do. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Don't forget this. Ten minutes after he gets to the back, the rest of it gets to back there. There you go. Good morning. Good morning. The scripture this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, and John chapter 7, verse 24. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. 
For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And then John chapter 7, verse 24, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Thank you, Gary. May God bless the reading of his holy word uh, this morning. And once again, it's uh, good to be back with you on a Sunday morning, and thank you to Mary Skilder as well as for Merlin Marshall for filling in so ably uh, last Sunday in my absence. And I'm also personally grateful to all of you who heard that I'd be back this Sunday and came anyway. So thank you. I appreciate that. And while we are at the beginning of this new year, it seems like we just got our Christmas decorations packed away. And in fact, that's one of the things I did last week while I was off. I got that done. Uh, now we are less than 10 days away from February. Can you believe that? Almost to February. Well, every new year brings with it wonderful opportunities and significant challenges. And those are come to us personally and also as a congregation. Some we can see coming and others we can't. One of the things that we know is happening in 2023 is this ongoing division in our denomination over a number of issues, but especially over whether a person who is actively living an LGBT uh, life can be ordained as a pastor in the United Methodist Church, and whether any pastor can perform a marriage ceremony between two LGBTQ people, whether it be inside the church building or not. Now don't worry, we're not gonna talk about that today. While we have provided information in the past uh, and will be providing more information to come, uh, that is not what this message is necessarily about. But I bring it up because the United Methodist Church has asked that all churches, considering whether to disaffiliate or not, within the denomination, start off with a period of discernment. Big word, discernment. I'll come back to define that in a moment. But as Christians, whether it is this issue facing our church or any number of issues that we are confronting uh, either personally or as a church, one of the first things that we should try to determine is what would God have us do in this situation? What is God's will? If you remember from a decade or two ago, everybody's wearing the wristband, WWJD, what would Jesus do? So with five Sundays between now and the beginning of Lent, I thought it would be helpful to look at how we go about answering those questions. How do we know what's God's will for us and how do we know what God wants us to do in any given situation? So for the next few weeks then, we're going to talk about how we can discern the will of God personally as a congregation. So will you pray with me? Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I want to share with you at the outset a story about a pilot who was flying alone in a small plane and he looked ahead uneasily because there was heavy black clouds that were rapidly approaching and his fuel was getting low. Should he turn back? The airfield behind him was further than the one ahead, so he decided to continue in spite of the dark clouds. But within minutes, he was engulfed in this unbroken grayness that seemed to have no dimensions, no up, no down, no right, nor left. Only this unchanging blankness. 
And after a time, he began to feel that his plane was climbing. Yet a glance at his instruments assured him that he was flying straight and level. Still, the impression that he was climbing persisted and grew stronger. Had his instruments gone awry? Could he trust them? Suppose they were faulty. Finally, his impressions won. He decided something must have gone wrong with his instruments and that he had better not rely on them. So he began to as we say, fly by the seat of his pants. Thus it was that a farmer making his way under those overcast skies to his barn heard a plane flying dangerously low and in a few moments heard the dull explosion that told him it had crashed. That condition is called spatial disorientation become disoriented and not, don't know what's up or down or, or right or left because you can't see and all the markers that you would ordinarily govern that by aren't there. For those of you who remember, that's exactly what happened in the plane crash that killed John F. Kennedy Jr. and his wife and, and uh, her sister. The good news is that as Christians, we have an instrument guidance system as well one that never fails or is faulty. It can be trusted with our very lives to bring us through every storm and allow us to arrive safely at our destination, which ultimately is heaven. You see, God is our instrument guidance system. The only question is whether we choose to believe and follow it or whether we choose to trust our own impressions and feelings of those others, uh, of others around us and experience the consequences of our misguided efforts. So how do we determine what our God instrument is telling us? How do we determine what God's will is for us? How do we develop the ability to spiritually discern what our actions or responses should be? Ah, yes, there's that word that I said we'd come back to, discern or discernment. Merriam-Webster Dictionary tells us that discernment is the power, the ability to see or grasp and comprehend what is not readily apparent or is obscure, particularly with regard to character or motives of someone else. In a biblical context, we are simply saying that through the power of the Holy Spirit, to we are able to clearly see what God desires of us. As Jesus told the woman at the well in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John, he said, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, if that's the kind of worshipers that God is seeking, that is the kind of worshipers we want to be, isn't it? But how do we do this? Especially in a world where we are bombarded with a wide variety of religious beliefs, biblical interpretations, directions as to what God's will is. And you can listen to various viewpoints that are seemingly logical explanations on one hand and yet are diametrically opposed to each other. So what are we supposed to do with that? So how can we acquire this spiritual discernment needed to determine how to worship God as he commands and to do his will? Over the next few weeks, we're going to examine some keys to help us develop the ability to figure this out. And Paul tells us this is possible to achieve. In his letter to the Romans, in the 12th chapter, he tells them that, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and discern and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And in his first letter to the Corinthians, he tells us that the things God has prepared for those who love him are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has fully given us. See, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned or understood only through the spirit. The person with the spirit makes judgment about all things because we are given the mind of Christ. So let's look at one of the first keys of developing this ability to discern the will of God. And one of the first keys to discerning that will is to recognize that there are spiritual absolutes. There are spiritual absolutes. As a foundation to understanding any field, whether it be math or science, construction, logic, reasoning, etc., there are are certain absolute facts, absolute truths, without which we would not be able to make any sense of that particular field. They're the foundation on which everything else is built. The truth is, with God, there are also absolutes. God, through his word, which is the Bible, clearly reveals his standards, and disobeying those standards is sin. Now, man has constantly been in search of the truth since time began. To paraphrase a country song, the problem is they've been looking for truth in all the wrong places. In response to Jesus' statement that the reason he was born and came into the world was to testify to the truth, Pontius Pilate asked the question that everyone has asked at one time or another, what is the truth? What is the truth? And earlier that very night in the upper room with the disciples, Jesus told them in John 14, verse 6, that I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. See, God sets forth what is clean and unclean, what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, what is obedience and disobedience. It's like that iconic scene from the 1992 movie, A Few Good Men. It's as if mankind has collectively shouted the line given by Tom Cruise, I want the truth. Yet, given mankind's response to God's truth, which is the Bible, Jack Nicholson's response seems appropriate. You can't handle the truth. Can't handle it. But everywhere today, we hear the message. There are no absolutes. Think what you want, say what you want, do what you want, even be what you want, even if that's a cat hissing at people. The philosophy in this world today seems to be that the only absolute is one's own personal values. So do as you please. The result is a serious inability to know right from wrong. As the Bible puts it, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who puts darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It's out of Isaiah. In contrast, this lack of absolute values, the Bible teaches that right and wrong, good and evil, are absolutes that ultimately and immutably def are defined by God. Still many today believe that they are able and they have the right to choose their own values. It is proper to create one's values strictly with reference to oneself. The message of the Bible is anything but that. The Bible in which God communicates to the human race speaks of absolute truths. 
So I asked, what is the source of the Bible? Is it simply words of human beings written down on paper? Or is it God speaking to us through the pages of this book? More than 370 times in the Old Testament alone, Scripture is said to be the words of the Lord. One example, Jeremiah 4, 27 said, Thus says the Lord. And the Bible explicitly claims to be the voice of God to us. Second Timothy, we're told that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So when God records his law in the Bible, he's not simply giving us good advice. He's laying down the absolute rules for living that are based on reality. God's laws recorded in the Bible spring from his character and constancy. So what are some of these basic absolute truths that we need to be firmly grounded in? There are many. I'm just going to give you a few. But here's some absolute truths that we can be certain of as Christians. Number one, only the Bible is, the, is inspired by God. You can read a lot of wonderful books. You can read a lot of magazines and articles. You can see a lot of preaching going on on television. But only the Bible itself is actually inspired by God in its words. Number two, salvation and truth only comes through Jesus Christ. We can't earn it ourselves. We're not entitled to it. It's Jesus' act of coming here and paying the price for us that gives us salvation. And that ties into the third one, which is salvation is not earned or deserved it's only received through God's undeserved grace and favor. We can live the best life we want to live. And you know what, folks? It isn't good enough. And some will say, well, why bother? Well, here's why we bother, because the fourth one is our faith in Christ as our Savior is the only requirement that God places on us. For whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There's no amendment, there's no codicil, there's no footnote, there's no additions. It's belief. And five, every Bible teacher, preacher, leader works for God, but they're only human. Never give a Christian person the glory that belongs to God only. We can, we can respect the Billy Grahams, the David Jeremiahs, the other great uh, speakers and teachers of the word and throughout history, Oswald Chambers and others. But they're just men. They have failings and, and flaws. But they were used by God to get his word to the people. And because they did, God's word took hold. So who deserves the praise for that? We can respect Billy Graham and the others. Great man. But if he reached people, it was because he was open to allow the spirit of God to work through him to reach others. And the praise and glory should go to God alone. And the last one I want to share with you this morning is that God and his laws are unchanging and eternal. They're set forth. They're not varied because of the culture that they're in or because of the time or the fad of the day. I can stand up here and say that the Bible says that God does not like divorce. And as you all know, I experienced that in my life. So does that mean I should now change the standard to fit what's happened in my life? Or does the standard remain the same? And I've just fallen short. 
like many of us have fallen short in various things. But God can still use people who have fallen short. But the standard is the same. So accepting this spiritual absolute as a part of discerning the will of God does require us then to make judgments. And it's no surprise that people who don't acknowledge God's authority to set standards of conduct hate being judged. They don't like anyone saying or even quietly believing that their conduct is wrong. Take this brief conversation as an illustration. Conversation between a secular person and a Christian. Secular person says, I want to do X. Fill in the blank yourself, whatever it is. I want to do X. Well, you're free to do it. But you think X is wrong. Yes. Because you want to control me. No, you're free to do whatever you wish. But you think X is wrong. Yes, but only because I want what's best for you. But I want to do X. You're free to do it. But I want you to say that X is good. I can't say that. Why are you such a hateful, intolerant bigot? You think that conversation is rare? Then take you long to look in the news, hear articles, read the paper, and see this is going on all over the place. This sentiment was present in the day of Solomon, uh, of Sodom. Lot, if you remember, had taken in a couple angels who were visiting. The angels were going to spend the, the, the night out in the village square. And he said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Come to my house. I'll take care of you. And when the men and boys of the village found out that they were there, they came and pounded on his door and demanded that the, he send the angels out so that they could do unthinkable things to them. And Lot protected him and said, you can't do this. To which they all said, how dare you, Lot, judge us? How dare you judge us? The point where they were going to attack Lot and the angels pulled him in. But people today who reject God's law similarly accuse people of judging them if their ungodly deeds are not accepted and celebrated. And there was an example just this week. Many of you may have read it. It's from the National Hockey League. Philadelphia Flyers. There was a game earlier this week where the team had decided that they were going to go out during warm-ups ahead of the game, all wearing these T-shirts with um, some statement of support for the LGBT community and so on, and, and their uh, sticks were going to be wrapped with rainbow tape and so on and so forth. It's just okay. But there was one player who said, because of my religious belief, I can't do that, so I'm just going to stay in the locker room. Didn't make a big deal of it. Didn't go out condemning the ones who went out on the ice. He didn't go out condemning the LGBTQ community. All he said is, I, I just, for me, I just can't participate and stayed in. You would have thought he conducted the most heinous act of anybody in the country. He was told to go back to Russia and maybe get involved in that war with Ukraine and maybe that would take care of him. Or that the, that the team was supposed to be fined a million dollars for even allowing such thing to happen, to allow him to stay in the locker room. Because he didn't want to say the X was good. And he was pilliard for it. Now, this isn't anything about LGBTQ uh, exactly, because I know many in that community who were offended that he was treated that way. 
forced support, coerced advocacy is worthless. He can believe what he wants to believe. They can believe what they want to believe. But the problem is, and you've got to know this, folks, is that when we take a stand for Christ, we're not always going to be liked or received well. There's going to be people who hate us and resent us and think we're awful, terrible, intolerant, bigoted, hateful people. So do we listen to the environment or do we keep our eyes focused on God's guidance system in the Bible? If you read the, any of the prophecy about the end times, you will see that these things happen. I'm not saying it's the end times right now. We, none of us know. But what I'm saying is that for so long in this country, we had the attitude that, um, you know, we believe in the Bible and we believe in Christ and, and everybody's fine with that. That may have been at one time. It isn't any longer. Didn't have to used to pay a price. You didn't have to used to be under attack. But we don't live in that world anymore, folks. So if you want to be a Christian and you want to follow God's will for your life, you need to put on some armor because the arrows are going to come slinging. In today's environment, that is hostile towards God's good and beneficial laws. Many people cite Christ's statement that Gary read earlier from Matthew. Judge not that you may not be judged. Even the biggest atheist and non-Christian can at least get one verse of the Bible, and it's always that one, to throw up against anybody who says they're doing wrong. Judge not, lest you be judged. But if you read the whole scripture, that's not what Christ is saying. That's a total misunderstanding. And many Christians misunderstand it too. He's not saying don't judge at all. He's saying don't judge hypocritically. If that person over there is doing something wrong, you can't point out that if you're doing the same thing. Get your life straightened out. And then the very last verse that was read, then you can go and get the speck out of your neighbor's eye. He's, saying don't, he's not saying not to judge. He's just saying don't do it hypocritically. Do it soundly. And of course, in the last verse, it said, stop judging by mere appearance, but instead judge correctly. There's judgment that's going to take place. On another occasion, Jesus clearly said, judge with righteous judgment. So folks, the first step in discerning the will of God is to understand that this book represents his word to us. And there are spiritual absolutes in here. And a lot of people aren't going to like them. And there's a lot of them we don't live up to ourselves. But that doesn't change what God's standards are. May we keep our eyes focused on God's guidance system to get us through any storm or any conflict that we may face. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the word. We thank you for your unchanging love. And we also thank you that your mercy and grace is available to everyone, everyone. It's not restrictive, it's not hateful, it's open to everyone. Allow us to stay strong in our faith and understand that when problems come up and we need an answer 
we go to you and ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand your word in Scripture. And in the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Will you please join me in our closing hymn, A Charge to Keep, I Have, page 413. Uh, it is on the screen as well. And if you're able, please stand. As you go from this place, remember this. The God we serve is merciful and compassionate, endlessly patient and full of faithful love. He is trustworthy in all that he says and faithful in all that he does. So go out in confidence, knowing that God goes with you. Amen. Amen.